Hello and welcome to the Happiness Festival, hosted by the Happiness Institute in association with Gowing Life and Talks Google. Today we are joined by Lord Jim O'Neill. Jim is the world-renowned economist. He has worked in some of the world's largest banks, including Bank of America, Swiss Bank Corporation and Goldman Sachs, the latter at which he was chief economist for a number of years. Jim is also the creator of the acronym BRIC, associating the world's emerging economies, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, and has conducted much research about these and other emerging economies. He has published various books on the topic, and in early 2014, made a documentary series for the BBC entitled Mint, The Next Economic Giants. Jim is currently the vice chair of Northern Powerhouse Partnership, chair of Chatham House, and a member of Shelter Social Housing Commission. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Albie. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you so much for your time. I'd love to um, ask you very simply, what does happiness mean to you? Hmm. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, As I believe as uh, an economist uh, and a person in general, that I think it's dangerous to have too strong a view about about too many things. Um, So I'm not sure the precise definition even of happiness to me uh, i know i know what contentment means but whether that's the same as happiness i'm not sure and i i think uh i know what unhappiness is i've experienced occasional times of not being very happy but to be truly happy um other than manchester united winning the treble every year in football <laughs> For the rest of time, I don't know how else I would define it, to be honest. <laughs> it's interesting you, you use the word contentment because throughout this process, we've been trying to figure out whether or not there was such a thing as objective happiness because right. it, it seems like everyone has a different uh, response to um, you know, what happiness means to them. And yet, you know, this, is all, this is close to our 50th talk and we're realizing that um, there are patterns emerging and contentment mm-hmm. is the word that um, people are using. You know, it's the absence of want. It is the a feeling of waking up in the morning and being excited about the day. So mm-hmm. I guess from a COVID perspective, I'd love to know, um, you know, how have you got through each day and how are you um, maintaining happiness in your daily routine at the moment? That's a very interesting uh, story to hear about the evidence of your previous interviews and i i think it makes sense what others have said to you i think it's uh and again relating to my own personal life uh by and large for much of my professional life i've i've felt very contented uh on many many days over many many years uh i've woken up and felt excited about whatever it was i was doing and felt in the middle of um, exciting things and rewarding things and that uh, they were making me feel like a better person uh, and a more contented person. But again, whether that is happiness, not sure. Mm. Um, But I I answer that way partly because one of the experiences I would say, uh, what are we now over four months since... uh, we all realized the scale of what was going to happen for us here in the UK and much of Europe and the developed world. Um, Many days I've been quite contented on a personal basis about this crisis, which uh, I don't know whether that makes me a bit odd, but certainly on on an intellectual basis, um, many aspects of it, uh, which I'll expand on a little, uh, have made me contented. Uh, because, because it's stimulating, um, you know, having somebody with my background, having been been through a whole variety of, of economic crises uh, and lived to tell the tale, I'm still alive and uh, most of my career has not been impaired by the crises I've gone through. Uh, somehow I've got through them and I've come out the other side. And one of the things I think that's partly why is um, I've always, from early on in my life, realized that one should never let a crisis go to waste and, uh, and, and, and think as closely, as objectively as one can as to what actually is really going on. And as difficult as it is to sort of subtract, subtract that from emotion, 
and then in you as yourself uh, perhaps think about behaving differently on an ongoing basis going forward and to learn from the, the circumstances of the crisis in particular and i think to the core of what the happiness institute represents uh, that's really important and it's certainly important for countries and leaders political leaders and business leaders and, and, and I've been thinking a lot about all these kind of issues during this crisis. In that regard, and relating it to the intro you gave me, uh, you know, the whole BRIC acronym and that part of my life that made me become so well known in international business happened because of the crisis of 9-11. It was that that forced me to think about this, the kind of peculiar, almost obsessive Americanization of the world and it, through the horrors of 9-11 it I concluded rightly or wrongly that that was the end of the American-led era uh, uh, of complete domination of the world um, and it certainly captured aspects of the mood of the subsequent 20 years nearly that we've gone through and uh, as I'm sure we'll get into linked to the sort of happiness agenda I, I feel that this could accelerate uh, the era of what I'm calling stakeholder capitalism uh, and a bit more responsible forms of business. Really interesting. I think um, I'd love to sort of understand how you feel that we can make the most out of this crisis and um, ultimately whether you think that um, policy is meant to make us happy and if indeed um, stakeholder capitalism is designed to generate more happiness in the world so let me try and say i could talk for hours in answering that but let me try and say about three or four things first of all as i'm sure you've had discussions with people more expert than me on already uh, a number of people have tried to to quantify and measure what happiness would be as a as a superior measure to gdp uh, and I'm pretty familiar with a lot of them, and, and none of them are very satisfactory and haven't really succeeded. And it's also reasonably clear that there is a reasonable correlation between most surveys of happiness or contentment and, and wealth, or at least shared wealth. Uh, and typically, not always, but typically societies that have more shared wealth uh, particularly if it's higher levels of shared wealth amongst their citizens, appear to be generally more satisfied, contented people than those that have extreme wealth and, of course, those that have very low wealth. And so that's the first part of answering you. Um, and I say it that way because one of the fascinating things about this crisis so far is, by and large, with some exceptions, but by and large, the countries that have seemed to have coped with it best are those that are typically the ones that score on objective indicators about sustainable economic developments uh, over the past 20 years or so, uh, almost irrelevant of who creates such indices. So, for example, uh, the Scandinavian countries, with the exception of the peculiar stance that Sweden has had, uh, have all had a pretty, pretty uh, okay crisis relative to others and they are countries that typically score so highly on sustainable development indicators uh much of north asia uh, notably south korea a country i've talked to you about uh personally quite a bit in the past one that's uh, left its imprint a lot on my mind uh, but also uh, a number of other north asian countries and very interestingly uh, in the context of the BRICS. Um, China's had, despite the fact that the virus originated in China, China's seemingly having a better crisis than, than the other BRIC countries. Uh, as we talk, the infection rate looks as though it's uh, out of control a bit in Brazil and India. Uh, quite know what's going on in Russia is hard to tell. And China, amazingly, seems to have somehow brought it under some kind of control and got economic growth back going again. Uh, despite all these issues that China has with the rest of the world. And what's interesting is on, on the development indicators I'm most familiar with, China scores higher uh, than the other three BRIC countries. And so it's very interesting to me that there are some broad parameters that one can uh, learn from. And then uh, the third thing to say, which is 
central to all of this and, and been quite relevant in my recent years of professional life is that we finally realized that you can't separate things like health from economics and finance. Uh, one of the things that has probably been the most gratifying thing I've ever done in my life was leading a review into uh, so-called antimicrobial resistance, of which antibiotic resistance is at the heart. Um, and uh, it, I learned through that and tried to advocate changes in, in policy making because of it, that uh, if we don't treat uh, our health systems more seriously in terms of being more robust, it would harm economic growth. And my goodness me, this crisis has obviously uh, demonstrated that pretty clearly. So I'm pretty sure one of the most obvious things we are going to learn is that we can't run health systems in this sort of just-in-time, uh, on-the-cheap uh, kind of process that many countries have had. Um, and, and, and that's a big thing to learn. Uh, and more broadly, it sort of fits in and uh, linked to another theme that I think is important. You always have to think of the circumstances in which crises have happened and what, what this crisis is doing in a lot of places. And you and I are living in Britain, so for that reason, I'll concentrate now a little bit. It highlights many of the deficiencies uh, so clearly of the countries. Mm. Uh, and uh, some of the areas where the UK is weak on these development indicators, education, skills, use of technology, these are all things where, where partly why the UK is struggling so much, in my view, beyond issues to do directly with the health system uh, during this crisis. Fascinating. There's so much in that. You know, I want to ask more about South Korea. Mm -hmm. But before I do... Um, you know, what gets measured gets managed was the message I really got from, from what you were saying, right? And yeah. some of these countries, you know, these Scandinavian countries, China, um, you also mentioned, do you get the feeling that they are measuring um, their own performance in a different sort of way and in a more nuanced way than we are in Britain or, you know, particularly in the US? You know, I've seen Donald Trump tweeting pictures of the market and saying, look, I've made the right decision because the market has gone up. You know, the market is not a proxy for well-being. And so mm. how can we um, measure things in a way that is um, going to be more efficacious, going to create yeah. greater yeah. Um, happiness in the world, if indeed that's the goal? But also, how can we as the electorate, as the people, hold our uh, politicians to account around these sort of measurements? I think it's a, a, a time for, for a lot of useful pausing, not least because of the amount of time a lot of at least better off people are, are being fortunate to, enough to spend at home uh, to really reflect on a lot of these things in many, many countries, especially Anglo-Saxon type democracies because of the, the issues you raise in response to my previous answer. Um, because I think the observation you make is, is, is pretty correct. Uh, and, and I think um, there is maybe a couple of things that, that perhaps tie into some of these countries I've touched on. That, and it's certainly evident from my experience in much of North Asia, and here, here, interestingly, I don't think it's any different whether it's a, a communist country or a democratic country, that there's, there's more societal awareness of the decision an individual makes. And in fact, quite often, the decisions an individual will make uh, will, will con contemplate straight away what will be the societal outcome of the decision I'm going to make. Whereas much of uh, modern... Uh, Western capitalist-based thinking, particularly in Anglo-Saxon countries, has been very different. It, it's been based on what am I going to get out of this uh, and not really thinking about the societal consequence. Mm. Uh, translated into macroeconomic terms, that's partly why we have what economists describe as so, so many market failures, uh, or as it relates to things like climate change, so many externalities that the economic system we're, we're living through, certainly I've lived through for most of my professional career, isn't capable of solving those societal challenges uh, and indeed is making a lot of them worse. Uh, but I think if you have a, 
a system that manages uh, that measures some kind of societal values or 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 a more advanced version of Gini coefficient, which mather, measures uh, the deviation between uh, people's well being or wealth or, or or some version of well being, I think would would be some sort of additional uh, purpose for how people might think and vote. Mm. Um, and it's it's tricky to find the right measures, and I've been involved in uh, in in exercises of trying to. Uh, uh, a pine on an auth- and, 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 and authorize uh, rewards for people that are doing these things. But I think it's really worthy of pursuit because I think for your generation, uh, this is the right path of the future. Mm. Uh, and, and again, as we've talked about in advance of this chat, interestingly in the world of investing, um, we, we have the nascent growth of, of a particularly amongst younger people entering the investing world of wanting to invest with more values than just what is the immediate profit that is going to be made from this investment decision. Mm. Uh, and I see that as a very healthy development. And I think uh, this crisis is probably going to accelerate it. Or I certainly hope it will. What do you think of success looks like in terms of um each generation do you think about um you know how you know this new wave of uh, of entrepreneur this new wave of, of professional is you know driving forward this mm. this conversation because you know it seems like it's the um it's the crux of the issue it's the problem that we need to be solving and do you think that that is because we're more altruistic because we're more philanthropic or do you think that it's just obvious that that's the problem that needs to be solved and actually this intergenerational bashing that's taking taking place to some degree is um is really unhelpful because the problems that your generation were solving mm-hmm. were, um were solved in your own sort of way and actually if you look at books like factfulness for example by hans rosling it's pretty clear that your generation has created a huge amount of wealth you have lifted billions of people out of poverty and deserve a huge amount of success. And so what does success look like from a generational perspective? I was, I was very close to mentioning uh, Hans's book to you uh, in the last part of the discussion. And, and I encourage anybody that's listening or watching this discussion to, to make sure they read it, not least because it's a pretty quick read, but it's very uplifting uh, during this, this, this worrying uh, crisis we're going through it's a very important thing to read uh, and I, I actually had the privilege of being asked by nature magazine uh, to write a, write a critique of it and I, I before Hans passed away what will it be now probably 15 months ago before the book was published uh, uh, I, I've got to know him reason, reasonably well because of some of the parallel areas we worked on and he was a great great human being but his book is very worth reading and I say that, and I'm glad you raised it, because I think one of the complexities, but, but fun complexities of life that I've experienced is what is necessarily right at one period in time isn't necessarily going to be right for the next period of time. So having the ability to be adaptive and to, and to change uh, without it, sort of being some major mental, personal, or system-wide disturbance is, is a critical uh, path for maintaining success. And it's very important in the context of uh, one specific thing that you touched on about Hans's book is that people quite often forget that the era that we are still going through, not with the same pace, but over the past 20 years or so, we have seen a staggering number of people around the world lifted out of basic poverty. And for all its faults, many aspects of globalization have been the key uh, instruments and driver of that. And that should not be belittled. And whilst there are many, many losers from aspects of the the move in capitalized uh, societies, and others, but also uh, with challenges of, of uh, the way the world economy has advanced, um, on a truly global basis, inequality has declined. And that is something obviously to be not only celebrated, but also continued. 
Uh, and, and if you look at uh, things that probably never end up happening this way, but simple, simple extrapolations of what would carry on the next 20 years of the past 20, by, by 2050, the only part of the world that would have any basic poverty left would, of course, be sadly some parts of Africa, uh, primarily Nigeria, given its uh, remarkable, remarkable demographics. And, and if, if that happens, then it, it will be incredibly wonderful. Uh, and, and many of the problems and issues related, well, I'll get onto now about intergenerational challenges and the, the problems that are so important for your generation to help and drive the solutions of, you know, it, it should be borne in mind against the fact that there's all these kind of things going on uh, and have been going on, which are pretty good. And, you know, these things get lost uh, with, with, the, with the rise of, of some aspects of populism. Now, with that being said, uh, and, and linked to what we've already touched on, I, I think we're in a position where some of these externalities or market failures uh, can now perhaps become internalized uh, and their incentives directly uh, for the system to solve. So, for example, one of the ideas that I'm quite uh, intellectually involved in and, and have a lot of discussion with advisors to policymakers is whether we can use what is known in the in the investing business as patient capital, particularly government provided capital, to directly incentive uh, uh, incentify um, the growth of capital to support businesses that directly can only thrive in a net zero emissions world. Uh, and, and I think there's a reasonable chance something like that, like that may happen in some economies. Uh, the EU is, uh, for all its faults, uh, spending a lot of time thinking about this. And it's not impossible that we could have something like this coming out of the UK. And that would be a tremendous development mm. uh, because then it would give us the chance of thinking that you know, we can get to net zero, but in a, in a wealth enhancing way. Mm. Uh, which otherwise, uh, for much of the past decade, is a complete pipe dream. Another example, of, sorry to, to go on a bit, but just this past few days ahead of our discussion, linked to the antimicrobial resistance world that I've been so involved in, uh, many of the world's leading pharmaceutical companies have actually announced a joint initiative uh, to provide uh, close to a billion dollar funding for a new entity that would sort of deal with what, again, is known in the investing world as the valley of death, of trying to help the sustainability of early stage biotechs on antibiotics. And I'm not sure uh, five years ago, the pharmaceutical world would have done that. Um, so that, you know, these are the sorts of things that I think should be encouraged more and more, and I'm hopeful may emerge. And your generation, which will, you know, be the next, uh, drivers of investment trends are going to be the ones that are that are in charge of this. Such a fascinating answer. My my question that emerged based on what you were saying in terms of policy being a good way to incentivize good behaviour is: Do you think that policy is the best way to change behaviour? <sighs> Not necessarily. Um, and I say that partly, and I say it quickly, uh, because typically the smartest policy is learning from the best examples of what some individual innovative thinker is doing already. Uh, and of course, there are examples of this today. I have friends that, that run sustainable investment businesses. And, and interestingly, in a couple of instances, their, their overall perform performance in terms of nominal return is actually higher uh, than the benchmark for, of all investment management firms. Uh, and so the, these, these are uh, true innovators in the world of investing that have got pretty strong conditionality between, behind how they invest. And so they're, they're an example setter for what uh, governments themselves as being ultimately the providers of uh, legitimate patient capital can do. The reason why I say not necessarily, be, because notwithstanding the fact that you can have the example setters coming from um, the private sector, it also the case, in my opinion, that 
if you want a society uh, to think more beyond just profit maximization, it is tricky uh, for patient capital to stick to the medium to long-term task of being there to help something come to fruition uh, without the patience that only governments can do. And yeah, another example in that, you know, I don't, I don't in this light want to give too many overly, overly strong examples from other countries, but if you think of post-war construction of Germany, arguably the most successful, successful of German developed countries, um, uh, the Germany's own development bank, KFW, which came out of Second World War reconstruction, plays a major role in Germany in this regard, including on a regional basis. Mm. And of course, uh, some, some uh, sovereign wealth funds or derivatives of sovereign wealth funds sort of play that role for some countries too. And I think it's something that, that could become a, a lot more uh, important in some of those uh, societies like the UK and the US that don't have them today. Mm. I'm thinking about the, um, the semantics of the word patient. Mm. Because... Um, you know, so much of the world at the moment, before, well, I say at the moment, before COVID, so much of the world was predicated and dominated by instant gratification. It was dominated yes. by being in a, in a rush and being addicted to um, the incentive reward system that's derived from technology. Technology mm -hmm. was designed in a way to give you pieces of dopamine that was addictive, right? Yeah. And we became addicted or are addicted to um, the ways that this um technology has been designed and you can see it in terms of the way that people are consuming content you know if you look at netflix you know the ways that it's the content is poured onto the platform you can just pour through it you can uh, watch a whole series in one one day exactly right and that is all about instant gratification and i'm now thinking um that's that word is juxtaposed semantically speaking to the word patient and how do you think do you think that investors have been guilty of the same thing of looking for instant gratification and do you feel like we need patient technology as much as we need patient capital i think it's a, a really interesting question and uh again i'll say i don't know the answer strongly but i have suspicions but i think i think you're onto something um, but part of why it's so complicated is that in the world of finance, and this, this you know, it, it exists in the center of humanity and all the, the great and evil things about humanity, like everything else. And certainly from my experience, uh, greed and fear are pretty close cousins. And, uh, and, and how... Uh, decisions made by those that govern us can, can improve the balance between greed and fear, uh, I, I think is probably an important pursuit, uh, if, if, I, if not very difficult to be successful about. You know, often when I'm asked uh, during normal crises that, you know, can we do X, Y, and Z to make sure this crisis and no other crisis ever happens again? I mean, I laugh because the answer, you know, crises are basically a fact of life, sadly. But I think if, if, if especially economic ones, but if there could be a set of incentive structures put in place to somehow uh, change the balance to, to stop the extremes of greed and fear, that would be a start. And I certainly think uh, that could be done in investing by, for example, uh, uh, the role of something called share buybacks, where, where uh, the past uh, 20 years, something that didn't happen much in the early part of my life has become you know, a compulsory part of business leadership life, where the name of the game is to try and buy as many of your own shares back as you can as possible, reduce the number in circulation, which amongst other things makes it a lot easier to reach your price earnings target, which surprise, surprise, uh, your compensation is often linked to, and it means you get uh, given ticks by your board and you get paid a lot. Mm. And it's kind of gaming the system. Mm. So a simple way of, of solving that problem is, is actually having a, a very higher 
marginal tax rates on share buybacks or, or having conditionality on them contributing to productivity gains or, or in, in the context of climate change, uh, some kind of, you know, a hurdle rate related to that. And there are many things like that you can do. The more interesting one as it relates to uh, aspects of technology, and uh, I think we might have chatted about this briefly in the past, but I, 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 I do find myself thinking uh, for the likes of uh, these very uh, compul- apparently compulsive forms of social media, like so, uh, Facebook and Twitter and all these kind of things, that I, I wonder if in years to come, one of the, the solutions, rather than them being given a lot of tax, taxes, that whether in fact... Uh, we find a system where people have to pay to use them um, and, and that they're actually not a free lunch. I wholeheartedly agree. As you were saying that, I was thinking of the expression, there's no such thing as a free breakfast. Right. We've sort of taken for granted that you're, you're given these amazing pieces of technology and you don't have to pay for them. And you're just thinking, oh, well, this is great. And yet every single time... Uh, uh, a, you know, a thing is generated on your email um, or when you go into the airport and it says, do you want to use free Wi-Fi? You're like, oh, great. This is free Wi-Fi. I can just press OK. And it's like, no, they are monetizing your data. And that leads to Cambridge Analytica. And that leads to our politics being yeah. Yeah. corrupted. And that leads to, you know, these companies got to make money somehow. So is the question, you know, would I be willing to pay for a Facebook equivalent if they were charging me what Netflix charges me? And it's, it's a really interesting question i i would not be surprised um if something like this changes in coming years uh and certainly i mean one of the one of the fascinating things about the strange world of economics is that is whilst it's a social science and it's full of enormous number of unknowns it does have this rather beautiful way of ultimately the price mechanism playing a role in reallocating uh, resources. Uh, and it seems to me pretty obvious that we're in the early stages of, of actually a lot of people realizing, well, actually, this thing isn't free. Mm, mm. It's, it's monetizing me in a, in a very, well, actually unsubtle way, but one that uh, I'm now starting to realize isn't free at all. And so if that becomes more and more the normative way of thinking, it would actually make a lot of sense for Facebook to wake up in, in another couple of years and say, you know what, we're going to stop advertising and what we're going to do is charge you all. Mm. And, and actually, that could result in many aspects of what these things deliver being much, of much superior, uh, credible contents uh, and would help propel society uh, forward further, going back to you know, the whole notion of adaptive success. Mm. So interesting. I'd love to um, pick your brains on stakeholder capitalism. You know, um, at the moment or through your generation, it was all about shareholder capitalism. There was a fiduciary responsibility for businesses to um, return capital to their investors. And, you know, what is the responsibility of companies under the banner of stakeholder capitalism? So I, I am, uh, this is uh, an area that uh, I'm trying to encourage the res- various research departments at Chatham House to be involved in some of the leadership thinking on. And so I'm quite aware of some of the more imaginative minds that are thinking about this area. But again, by the way, I encourage you, Albie, for everything you represent in what I know of our past conversations, but in, in this institute to play a role. I, I, and I don't think there is an answer yet, but because we're in the early stages of it, but I think the answer relates to uh, where the, the role of the board of a company that's, that, that sets the criteria of how its executive leadership uh, will be behaved and compensated will be, in essence, to optimize a number of goals as opposed to maximizing shareholders' value, um, which is quite different. Uh, and, of course... Uh, more complex because, as I've heard uh, a very, very famous investor say publicly when he was quizzed about this, you know, that I, as in he, has found it difficult enough trying to succeed, just trying to answer to one paymaster. 
So if he has to start considering four or five, then it's going to be, uh, I think he used the phrase impossible. But uh, next, when I see that individual, I haven't seen him for years, I will say, listen, you strike me as a pretty smart human being. I think you're more than capable of responding to just one stimulant. Uh, and I think that's what, what is going to emerge and trying to f find the right mix of, of, of the balance of those four or five factors, I think is going to be the key uh, for the investment world and the, 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 the form of corporate governance over the next 20 to 30 years, to be honest with you. Um, the problem with talking to you, Jim, is just hundreds of questions pour through my brain. <laughs> it's sort of quite exhausting trying to figure out which one I want to ask. But um, Michael Gove, when um, he was campaigning for Brexit, famously said, you know, we're bored of experts. And you were talking earlier about economics and how it's a social science. But I think a lot of people would agree that it's been put up on a pedestal. It's been given... Um, it's been given more attention than mm -hmm. um, most other areas of, of research. Yeah. Now, as an economist, does that pose, you know, does it pose an existential crisis to you to think about how potentially, you know, the area of, um, of personal interests that you've pursued in your career is, is getting a lot of criticism for the way that it's designed? Not really. I think it, I think it's, I've got to be, I'll be contradictory. I think, first of all, I think it's amusing. Secondly, uh, I, think it, I think it's just, just worthy in some cases. Uh, and thirdly, let's hope uh, the profession of economists uh, respond and, 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 and have a good answer. Uh, and, and let me try and link why I say those uh, answers. Um, the first one, you know, I say amusing because... You know, I've been very lucky in my, in my professional life, uh, I think. And as I said at the start of our discussion, I feel quite contented, generally speaking. Um, and it's not because uh, I wake up every morning and think, oh, aren't I lucky to be an economist? Uh, you know, and I, I have a lot of friends, uh, the last thing, you know, who are not economists. And, I, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if in generally from my experience, that a lot of economists are actually as smart as a lot of them think they are. Um, um, and I think it's quite funny. Um, and, and the second thing to say linked to this is I've already touched on it. You know, economics is a social science. And, and again, both with, with, with the amusing comment, but also I'm not surprised. Yeah, I, I did my PhD in an era where uh, we didn't have laptops or mobile phones. I, I had to do my econometric analysis as part of my PhD using a mainframe computer. Uh, this was in the uh, turn of the, of the 70s into the 80s. And it was kind of potluck whether the, the computer printed out uh, or not the following morning. You'd sort of go to bed praying that your, your punch card had worked. Uh, and so I kind of, you know, and there'd be many days when it didn't. Uh, and, and I remember thinking to myself, I wonder if my supervisor realizes that it's potluck. You know, and I remember sharing an office with a guy at the time. who It was during the Iranian Revolution. And this poor, it was an Iranian guy. This poor guy was on his seventh year of his PhD, partly because his supervisor that knew nothing about econometrics wanted this machine to give the precise answer that he thought it should give. Mm. And, and that, that sort of taught me right then that there was aspects of economics that were basically a bit silly. <laughs> um, and, and, and I often wonder about and think that was one of the biggest things I learned from my PhD, that it really is a social science. So, you know, one of the reasons why the economics profession is, is having the criticism and has had the criticism it, it, it's had is because it's been justified because far too many economists believe that there is definite answers to a lot of questions that don't have definite answers. Uh, and so, you know, economists have to, to live a bit more in the real world and not, not think they know all the answers. Yeah, there's... <laughs> and it's not black and white. Yeah. Exactly. It's not black and white. You know, I'm, I'm coming up to 30 now. And that's one of the real lessons that I feel like I've learned in my 20s is that you go into the, 
into the workplace and into the real world and you sort of think oh you know i'm i'm a good person and there are bad people out there but i feel like i'm a good person which means good things will come to me and i just gotta um knuckle down and sort of be you know to some degree naive about the world it's sort of black and white and you sort of you realize the amount of nuance the idiosyncrasy the sort of complexity of it all and there's a really interesting thinker out there who really drives forward that notion that the world is inherently complex. And what we do is our brain is hardwired to find simplicity and complexity so that we basically mm. don't implode, so that we can try and find meaning and purpose in our life. Yeah. And um, I think being aware of that shortcut that our brain does is really important. It's very good to have beliefs, but it's actually quite short-sighted or myopic to have ideologies. I agree with so, that. I really like, I think what you're saying is around the certainty aspect, you know, lots of. Listen, I've spent, I've spent uh, a long time in my professional career at the, at the hard, hard edge of, of forecasting with, uh, um, as well as investing with some very, very tough taskmasters. Some of the world's most famous investors I've got to know well through this process. And, um, you know, one of one of the bruises I learned early on, on top of the, my PhD, is that, that particularly in, in very commoditized markets like foreign exchange, in particular, where I spent so much of my time, I'd know often that I was going to be wrong. Uh, but I, I learned early on to realizing that I knew I was going to be wrong quite often, mm. and you know that was that was the reality. And I, I'll never forget one of my earliest days uh, at Swiss Bank Corporation. You mentioned SPC. When when uh, a new head of sales came in uh, and wanted you know to take me around all these clients and say, what 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 do you think about the dollar? What are we going to tell people? And I say, you know what? I don't actually at the moment really know. And this guy was like, what? You don't know? I said, no. And 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 he he was distraught. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I said, well, that's you know that's my honest answer. If you don't like it, hard luck. And. Uh, but it, it, it allowed me to get through and, and to be able to sleep at night because otherwise in, in the kind of intensity of those kind of, of that narrow world, I mean, you wouldn't have done otherwise. And yeah. I used to, and I learned to, when I became more senior and managed a lot of people, I used to often say, listen, don't kid yourself uh, about saying yes all the time and knowing the answer, both, both in terms of things like that, but more importantly, and again, I'll be important for you, I think, and your generation going forward is don't overcommit mm. to things and certainly don't uh, say yes to people that sort of have an expectation that you'll just do whatever they want because you won't be able to deliver it all. Mm. And one of the best things somehow I think I've learned through my own life is that the ability to say no politely is a, is a really important uh, quality to have in my view. I wish I would have learned it earlier. It's a really often. interesting piece of advice, I think, to people listening is that, you know, saying no can lead to greater happiness and well-being and can so. um, give you more clarity. And there are lots of takers out there that want to take your time or yeah. want the yeah. credit for the work that you're going to do. You know, one of my favorite quotes is, imagine what we can achieve if you don't care who gets the credit. And I think that reinforces that there's a lot of competition out there and there's a lot of people who are taking I agree from you. Um, another quote because I'm always um, thinking about quotes because I love them and I feel like it sees simplicity and complexity is that the wise man thinks he is uh, or knows he is foolish and the foolish man thinks he is wise and so <laughs> around what we were just discussing do we have too many um, foolish politicians who think they are wise and how do you think that the electorate would respond if politicians stood up and said, you know, more often we don't really know exactly what's going to happen, but we're just making the best of the information that we have available. I think it would be a breath of fresh air. Um, you know, as somebody that's spent uh, 17 months myself as a minister uh, in a government, something I never, ever dreamt I would do, I, obviously, I have limited experience, and you know, I have no regrets about having do it, having done it. Uh, but it, it sort of seems a slightly alien world 
where, it, uh, from what I observed, it was sort of like a pre- professional pursuit in itself. And mm. because so many of them are wrapped into the political machine that they're part of, it's sort of seen as a sort of, you know, where are you in the status of, and how are you going to jump to the next level? And it all seemed a bit weird to me. Uh, but I think part of our challenge, again, uh, certainly in the UK, uh, is that we have a, far too much of that going on. And I think a, a lot more awareness of the limitations of what any of us are capable of and whether the decisions we make are necessarily going to be right or wrong, I think would be a, a, a great contribution to society and probably greater contentment. Mm. Last question for you, Jim. Yeah. And, um, you know, I want to say thank you so much for your time on behalf of the Happiness Institute. It's been a really, really interesting conversation. Um, you said you're optimistic. You know, you certainly expressed this joy de vivre, this sort of feeling of um, not only are things going to be all right, but actually this is a really good opportunity, both individually and collectively. If you could just expand on that and mm-hmm. leave us with a, um, an optimistic note, that would be uh, much appreciated. Uh, I shall try. And thank you very much for having me. It's been a great uh conversation i've enjoyed it and it's making me think more about some of my own suspicions uh, as we've gone through the chat um so w- with the important caveat that which can be a big mistake also and i hope i'm not making it that one confuses what you would like to happen in the future with what is going to happen and there's a great danger uh in doing that so with that proviso, it, it seems to me that whilst this crisis has obviously been unique uh, in my generation, never mind yours, I think it does shed, the, shed light on a lot of challenges that have grown in the past few years. And therefore, I think it's reasonably logical that it forces further weight, intellectual weight, and therefore probably with it, impetus on the solution of some of those challenges. Mm. So, for example, the whole intergenerational divide. Uh, I would be amazed if governments of of the day uh, don't, during the uh, emergence out of this crisis, do a lot more to try and support uh, your generation and the next generation. And you can already see uh, some signs of that here in the UK with some of the sound bites that are being made. And I would imagine we're going to see see more of that. Uh, on climate change, uh, I talked a bit about the idea of patient capital funds. Um, bizarrely, because of the scale of the economic hit we've had in the second quarter around the Western world, wh- whilst it's painful, you know, we have seen in our daily lives through nature and, and the lack of pollution that actually there are certain paths you can pursue to get rid of this stuff. Mm. And I think we can build back, you know, to coin a phrase, build back better in in that sense. Uh, and for broader issues linked to, to, to health challenges, I touched briefly on the antimicrobial resistance fund uh, that the pharmaceutical companies can, have, have announced. It's a tiny little development, but it, it, it seems to me that suddenly... Um, many people are thinking about, you know, what, what can we do to play a more active role in to solve some, solving some of these other challenges as, as well as uh, enabling us to get out of this one. Mm-hmm. And, and the last thing of them all, I, I would say, where I, where I do find myself uh, oddly optimistic to many experts is, is for my limited but, but some contact with those at the heart of vaccine discovery I think it is not impossible that we could get a number of vaccines more quickly than I hear many experts talking about. Uh, mm. and, and, and let me finish in this regard by emphasizing, I really do hope I'm not confusing what I would like to happen with what will happen. Mm. I really like that answer. And the reframe that I took from that is... Um, what Einstein said when he said that if you have one hour to save the world, how would you spend that hour? And he replied, I'll spend 50 mi- 55 minutes defining the problem and then five minutes solving it. And <laughs> we sort of, through this crisis, we've realized the problem. 
we really understand the problem of what needs to happen. We need to make sure that um, if this does happen again, you know, we are prepared and we need to make sure that um, some of the inequalities that we see in society are corrected. So thank you so much for that reframe and for this optimistic conversation. And on behalf of the Happiness Institute, have a lovely day. Lovely. All right, Albie, thank, thank you so you. much for having me on. Thanks, Jim.